All right, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Back to the Blockbuster Presents Deep Dives, where we talk about the movies you love or some of the movies you might have forgotten about. Um, on today's episode, we have our first repeat guest, other than Jackson. Jackson is on the main show, so he not to say that Jackson doesn't count, like, but Jackson is a part of the the, the family already. He's a part of the team. Uh, yeah. So, like, when, so when he wants to hop over to the spinoff, he can hop over to it even though he always asked he always asked for permission still like we were we're setting one up with another uh group of people and he heard what movie it was and he was like oh can i be on that one i was like you don't have to ask like it's also it's also right. your show um so other than jackson uh we got dustin ripka back after he was on talking collateral with me on the deep dive another uh fantastic mm. movie that he shows and you guys really liked that episode and like the conversation so I was like, do you want to do it again? And he was like, yes. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he picked a really, uh, really fun movie. And also, um, once he tells you what it is, it will be of the type of movie it is. It's the first time we've actually covered the style of movie uh, on the show. Uh, oh, wow. So, that is, so that's, that's fun, yeah. too. So, uh, Dustin, welcome. Um, before we get into the movie, though, uh, let us know if there's anything you got going on uh, with your podcast. Um, oh, funny so, story too. One of one of my girlfriends listened to it, and she was just like, "I just loved how it was like a." You guys were like, "Yeah, his podcast is this, which is so different from yours." And then you guys kind of just segued right into talking in the movie, and somehow it really works, and it wasn't jarring. So she was like, "Good job." <laughs> yeah. That. <laughs> no, that's 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 awesome, and I I mean, and and thank you to anybody who would who would listen or or watch on YouTube like that. You know, it means a lot. We we I have a for people who don't know, I have a, a sex and relationships and dating podcast called Sex Party. Uh, it is every bit as wild as you would think it is, but it's also um, <clears throat> you know we have experts on, we have sex workers on we have coaches we have um people who have mastered the art of dating and whatever i mean anybody you can imagine celebrities sometimes um and you know it's equal parts uh chaos and equal parts value so every time you tune in you should be able to chuckle at my nonsense and then learn something whether it's a new tactic for dating or in the bedroom or, or, or whatever whatever it is and uh yeah i think um I mean, it's hard out here, you know, like <laughs> people, people don't realize like how much crazy stuff we've been told growing up. So this is the, my, my show aims to sort of break that down and you can find it everywhere you find podcasts and uh, on YouTube every single Wednesday, um, just celebrated two years. So uh, I'm super pumped. Oh, yes. Yeah. Congratulations. I yeah, thought you. that was awesome. Yeah. yeah thank yeah, you so much. Cool. Yeah. Because because uh, we we did back in November, so we're not too far you're not too far away mm -hmm. from us. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. it's crazy because like it feels like a long time, but that like these things are always like constantly evolving. So it feels like mm -hmm. you're almost yeah. like starting anew a little bit once you get more yeah. like you know uh, the, like a lot of people who listen know that the, this show has gone through a lot of different co-hosts. Thankfully, Jackson's been on for over a year and he has stuck and it's been really good but there's not a lot of changes with the show so with each change it feels like you have to like start over <laughs> again mm -hmm. yeah um, t totally and like you know originally like and i might have said this on the on our first episode and if i didn't great and uh if i did just you know edit me out but um <laughs> i'll be repetitive <laughs> i guess but like you know your content and then later your podcast like i I'm, I'm such a movie i'm such a pop culture nerd but i'm also like such a film a television narrative like fan and so even though i have a sex and relationships podcast you can see you know the pop culture references i mean i named title i the titles of episodes if you're if you're into easter eggs just go look at my title <laughs> list and you'll be like oh that's that's Ghostbuster or that's Die Hard or that's so like I, I do that on purpose because I don't know how other how, how else to do it. Originally, I was going to do a film, you know, an entertainment television podcast. But like, you know, I, I am such a fan of what you do and what what, you know, your your uh, your team does. Right. Then I'm like, how am I? I'd rather just be a fan of you guys and like new rock stars and all these other things, because it's like 
I'm not going to be as good as, so I'm like that. We, we wound up, we went the sexual way instead. So <laughs> yeah, it works. It works. I mean, I, I couldn't, not that I had not uh, an open book with my friends and discussions with them, but I don't think I could do what you do. And uh, you know, I think everyone has their niche, right. And everything that they're able to discuss freely and yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, you do what you do well, and I appreciate you saying that we do what we do well over here. So, I uh, will greatly appreciate it. Um, so, I wanted to uh, give you a chance now um, that we uh, got our reintroductions in. Uh, let yeah. everyone know what movie you chose. And I was actually really like, you talked about like at one point if you should change it, oh. and I was like, no, I was like, no, 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 no. I think this one will be good because I I would have never thought to do it. And yeah. even though I love it, I would have never been like, oh, let's do that one. And uh, I thought it was a great choice. And I think everyone's going to enjoy it. So, uh, yeah, let them know what you picked. So I think if you listen to our last episode on Collateral, you know, we talked about a Michael Mann shared universe. We talked about, um, you know, all of the all of the stuff with Heat, too, and all of those things. And we really did do a deep dive. And I think, you know, you and I are both like diehard fans of Vanilla Sky. And and, and I thought, <laughs> you know, people probably thought like, hey, they're going to do Vanilla Sky. Right. But I hate yeah. being I really hate being predictable. I, I love having a sharp left turn. Oh, my God, that he's the bad guy. Like, I love that. Like, so I was like, how do I sharp left turn this? So the movie I chose is Batman Mask of the Phantasm. And, and I think we're going to have fun with it. Uh, I think so too. Not that Vanilla Sky would have been bad. I think there was a lot of there. I think there well, was a lot of hits yeah. that latter episode because we kept bringing yeah. it up, and I was like, "Oh, we should probably do that one." Then you're like, "Well, you were like the next time I shook, come on, we probably shouldn't do two Tom Cruise movies in a row, in a row, right?" And, <laughs> right and, yeah. and I was and I was like, "Yeah, that's probably true, but keep it in your back pocket, though." No, yeah, I think I think when we we should find a special way to drop the Vanilla Sky episode when we do it, like something weird, yeah. like we'll do some promo or something crazy. Yeah, we'll make it work. Um, and then I was I, the reason I was what I the reason I was so excited for it because, like I said, why? But I meant why we haven't done a film like this. We haven't really we have never covered the animated movie uh, mm -hmm. in detail on either show, whether for an anniversary or. Uh, on the deep dive so this was exciting because it was the first for me to do it this way um i also probably like you grew up watching batman the animated series so i was really excited to discuss it on that level and then also uh it'll probably give us a chance to talk about uh kevin conroy too who does the voice of bruce wayne batman and you know he he sadly passed away but i think for a lot of people he remains the signature Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess there's so many live action versions of Batman, right? So it's hard when you're trying to rank them all, where you put him in. But I think if you were to think of the voice, uh, like who encompasses your Batman and, and Kevin Conroy is that for a lot of people, even if they don't know the guy's name, they might be like, uh, who's the guy who did the voice on the animated series or right. in that animated movie. Um, <clears throat> so it was a good opportunity to talk about that. And then also getting into, um, how the release of this was handled too i i knew that it was it had a theatrical release i didn't know how short and mm -hmm. why it was so short and why they pivoted from us you know straight to home video release to a theatrical release which seemed like it's because they had like faith in it but then it became on you know on the end of warner brothers like rushing it to get it yeah. out in time on christmas day um they really didn't have the time necessary to promote it the way that they wanted it to. And it didn't have a long life in theaters, despite how, you know, when I was a kid, it felt like it was really popular. But mm -hmm. I think by the time that I realized its popularity, it had already become popular via home video and all that. So, you know, they did say that it eventually made its money back in the home video market. And yeah. um, they actually, they actually re recently released a uh, 4k edition of it too, which I, that's how I watched wow. it for this um, looks and nice. sounds great. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it was a, a fun rewatch. I hadn't watched this in a really long time, like years, years mm -hmm. upon years since the last time I watched it uh, fully. And um, it, I think it might be like one of my up there in the tops of one of my favorite, like just Batman mm -hmm. projects ever, whether it be animated or live action. Yeah, I mean, this if you're a Batman fan, 
this is, well, here we go already with the fucking controversy. But if you're a Batman <laughs> fan and you, you don't have this one in your top five, you need to put to, to potentially like reevaluate your top five. And the thing is, is you know, I had seen it as a kid. I was the, a lucky person who got to see it uh, as a child because you know, Batman '89 with Keaton. Like for me, I was like eight years old, right? And in '89, it, it had all been. It, it had all been basically like Ninja Turtles and like Ghostbusters, right? I didn't know who Batman was. I wasn't a co comic book kid yet. And my parents came back and they had seen like, you know, as adults, like them and another couple went and saw it on Friday <clears throat> when it first came out. And they were just so blown away. Obviously, Jack Nicholson, all these things. Uh, yeah. and they were debating, is it too dark? So then, so they took my sister and I, I'm eight she's fucking six right and so when i came out of that theater i was a, ch yeah. a changed person and like i batman is my number one all-time favorite uh and you know it, it changed the way i looked at at everything including like marketing you, you can even look at sex party and and see some of the the, the like the symbol right whatever so when when right, right. ask the when Mask of the Phantasm, I think I want to say 89 and then and then Batman Returns, I think it was 92. And yep. it just it didn't do very well. This was 93. Uh, and I yeah. think the animated series has had been going for a season or two, right? And right. it was it was such a it was such a hit. And so when this came out in theaters, it was like, oh my god, you know, and it was mysterious mask of the phantasm what the hell you know and so when it came out i saw it in theaters as a kid and then i kind of like knew about it i think i maybe watched it once again in my early 20s but in 22 just at the tail end of like the masking and stuff for the pandemic there's this classic little theater it's it's for, it was built in 1910 called the music box here in uh chicago and they do these really cool as you would imagine like anything i mean hitchcock and whatever they had a midnight yeah. screening it was only a midnight screening of oh, nice. a 35 a 35 millimeter cut of batman mask of the phantasm and the previews were all like old ads from the 90s like before like instead of showing movie, oh, movie previews, cool. they showed like you know 35 minutes of like old toys and animated series ads and whatever and so it was a really cool experience but the one of the reasons i chose this right is because when i saw that as a full-fledged adult i was blown away at how dark and adult this film was and it it felt like the people from the television show from the animated series show got to do everything they wanted that was darker and more adult in this because it was for a wider audience. I mean, the Joker's run right. around with, with missing a tooth for half, you know, the last half of the movie <laughs> there's actual blood. Like when, like the punches actually land, there's some gnarly yeah. fucking deaths. Like it's the, this is the first film, uh, besides this is the first animated depiction of Joker gas actually killing someone, which yeah. I thought I thought was really interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, and and you know, like, dude, Batman at its core is about trauma and PTSD, and this fucking thing does not hold back addressing that. You just have to really kind of be an adult to see it, to look for it, to see it. You know? Yeah, it's true. When you're watching it as a kid, it's just all like a bunch of cool imagery and um it's fun on that level um why i mean i think i've seen it you know like i said it's been years but i didn't see it again as an adult and remembered how i think it, i saw it that's how long it's been before this i think right after batman begins was the last time i watched it so that was a long time ago mm -hmm. um I think, you know for, in case people don't remember that batman begins came out in 2005 so it was a little <laughs> bit after that, that i watched this again yeah and uh and watching it as a full-fledged adult there are a lot of adult themes in it you're right people do die <laughs> um it's yeah it's violent um and it's dark i mean the animated series was dark too it actually played you know someone made a good comment um i think it was on the special feature i watched for the movie where they said that the animated show wasn't afraid to play sophisticated for adults but was still able to appeal to kids and that is kind of where um 
the DNA for this movie lies, and it kind of just ran with that a little bit more. Like, if you're a child, there's things that you can love. And then as an adult, there's also themes that you're like, I totally missed that when I was, you know, eight <laughs> or whatever old when right. I where you saw it for the first time. Yeah, and, for sure. Uh, and then you want to appreciate it on a whole other level. I'm glad you said what you said that it should be in uh, your top five uh, yeah. Batman uh, film, whatever you want to, you know. I think some people might dismiss it because it's an animated film. Yeah. Um, but it really um, works just as well as some of the live action stuff you got we got and i you know i too was a child of batman 89 and uh lo- loved that movie but i remember this came i remember all this being coming out in a really interesting time because 89 was very successful and changed how basically how movies were marketed mm-hmm. uh back then and then in 92 um in the summer of 92 you got batman returns and you know i like it I've always liked it, but you know, mm-hmm. it definitely was. It's a Tim, it's a Tim Burton movie first, and a Batman yeah. movie second, uh. and it's and it's really dark and much darker and different than uh, the first movie. And this was a movie that was really marketed towards kids. Uh, a lot of Happy Meal tie-ins. So when parents would t- to take their kids to go see it, they walked out very very angry. And so yeah. that movie wasn't as successful as the first Batman, but then the animated series <clears throat> came out in September of 92 and, and right away changes the face of like what animated cartoons, especially of this kind of medium of comic book cartoons could be and mm-hmm. quickly became successful on Fox. And, and I think with this coming in 93, I think the, I think the initial thought, which is probably, probably why they chose to pivot, to a theatrical release was they saw how successful the cartoon was and wanted to monopolize on that. But then I think they also wanted to cut, not the creatives, but the studio wanted to cut corners and get it out quickly. <clears throat> and from what I heard, they had an eight month turnaround to get this all done. And that is, uh, even though that seems like a long time for an animated uh, project with so much going on, it's yeah. not a really long, it's not a long no. time at all. So they had they had to you know get it all done, finish it, and then promote it. And they didn't have time to do all that the most effectively. So, you know, I I didn't know I didn't realize it came out on Christmas Day when it was released, but it came out on Christmas Day. And usually that is a day that movies do a little bit better. They get like a bump because mm-hmm. everyone's out of school, out of work, but this just didn't have the marketing behind it that it yeah. needed. And when when we say when I say quick, uh, it had a six million dollar budget and only made five point six million dollars total during its whole run in theaters. So that is, it came and went <laughs> really fast. Yeah, in, in theater, unfortunately, um, but home video definitely saved it and gave it a brand new life. Which you know is interesting because that was the, that was the original idea anyway. Once they released it straight to video, yeah. I mean, I love the I love the idea of why they wanted theatrical. I just wish they would have given it the time to breathe so it could have possibly done better in theaters. Yeah, it seems like maybe there was some panic uh, from Batman Returns, and they were trying to like I don't want to say make up because it's a whole different thing, but I think they were just trying to to utilize the IP, and they were just trying to like push the oh oh you have this you have a movie that you're gonna put on TV or direct a video or whatever like let's make it a theatrical thing and pump it up on whatever, but like you know they you're right they didn't they didn't market it uh effectively whatsoever but like think about the original posters because i can remember seeing the like this the cardboard stand standee yeah. in, in the and it's like you know batman like with his wings up you know or with his cape up like wings in this crazy like art deco noirish thing and then this foreboding phantasm mask i mean you could have done so much many cool marketing things with that like just no. just the, and the fact that it was a new, you know, it was a new villain, and that that is that is something that I think still to this day like hasn't been capitalized. And I have a point to make about that later. I'll drop a bomb yeah, on, yeah. On, on, on that oh, one. Okay. But <laughs> but but um, you know, I think it is. You're right. It is a bit of a testament to how good it is that it did flourish. You know, on on home video. I mean, people really picked it up, and they would watch it right alongside you know, the, the animated series that was, that was 
headed into syndication or, or, or whatever, just pumping out new, new episodes. I mean, that a, a lot of people did, did grow up with that, that world. And, you know, this thing is like, <clears throat> yeah, animated. Sure. Like, like we, we talk about and like, but there's some classics, like, I mean, you know, I go back to like cowboy bebop and shit. Like that's one of the greatest fucking most emotional stories I've ever seen. The whole thing's anime, the whole thing's animated. Yeah. And like, for for this, I mean, this movie it it doesn't it doesn't redo Bruce Wayne's origins, but the the backstory because they sort of they jump to the past, jump to the present, and jump to the past, jump to the present, yeah. and you get all these cool like it is so well written, it is so well written yeah. because it runs alongside of the traditional Batman origin story that we know. And it fills in all these holes that that are that were that were there. And even it even fills in holes for the Joker's origin. It fills in holes for Batman's origin, you know, and yeah. then you get to like, again, the trauma and like the 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 the, the loss of of his parents. And it, it just it tackles it in such an adult way that it almost does take, you know, multiple viewings to, to pick up on. I mean, that scene where he's at his parents' gravestone and, he, oh, and, it's, rain, yeah. and it's raining and he's crying. That's award-winning writing right there. And, and, and also award-winning yeah. acting. I mean, that is really, that's good. one of the most powerful scenes. Like he's, he's asking, he's fallen in love. He's asking his parents for permission not to become the Batman. You know what I mean? And like, yeah, that's so, it's... that's so sad, but it also like shows you kind of how, how, you know, how trauma and PTSD has affected his brain. Yeah. I would say across all the films, that moment probably depicts uh, the situation uh, going on with him and the loss of his parents and what mm -hmm. that has done to him uh, and why he has felt he has to take on this mantle. Uh, that I think that conveys it the best out of all the films that we got him that <clears throat> deals, it, it, you know, in his origins. That scene is, very well written, very well done, and yeah. like you said on both ends, Kevin Conroy does a good job of conveying the emotions in that, and uh, and it's asking for permission. It almost sounds like begging, like can you please, oh, can yeah. I please let this go? Uh, I don't want it, like so I can so I can live like a normal life, basically. Mm -hmm. And yeah. oh, and then you know, and it's almost done in a way where it's framed in such a way that it's almost like a child talking to their parents as if I don't want you to be disappointed in me if I choose to do something mm -hmm. else. There's a lot of layers in that scene that just really work well. And it, like you said, it's good writing and some good voice acting uh, on his part. And probably my favorite scene in the movie. I mean, there's some other fun stuff in it, yeah, but like, totally. as far as like, as far as, you know, grabbing the emotions, that's probably the best moment in the whole movie. Yeah, and I think it's a, it, it's a classic again, like top three, I would say probably Batman moments in all of, in in all cinema, and and you know because we as the audience viewing the story and knowing knowing the tale of Bruce Wayne and the Batman, we know that his parents, that's the last thing they want for him is to become a bat and go out at night and beat up poor people. Like we don't, they don't no. like, they don't, <laughs> they don't, they don't want that. They'd want him to to build a hospital and you know, outfit the cops with whatever and, and be happy yeah. and have children. Right. And he, and there he is on his knees begging for forgiveness, not to be this animal, not to be this, this creature of the night. And it, and, and if you think for, if you just for a second, if you apply that monologue and that scene to any of your on, on camera, uh, real, you know, in real life, whether it's Pattinson or or keaton or affleck if you take that scene and apply it to them god it fucking breaks your heart because it makes you look at all the other batman movies totally yeah. di different like this man yes he's intelligent yes he's uh you know can train himself to do whatever and all these other things but like he is is suffering like underneath that mask is like nothing but suffering and so they were yeah. able to take an animated film and a piece of writing and one little scene and it's like you know last night i was thinking about it i was like dude like 
if that scene was filled with Pattinson, if that scene was filled with fucking Christian Bale or Michael Keaton, like, dude, that that would be some. They would be talking about Oscar and shit for maybe raving and, about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because it makes you feel kind of sick to your stomach a little bit that like he thinks that he has to put on a bat costume to because his parents want him to. And I mean that, yeah. that, you know, and he's, and he doesn't want to, he wants to be in love. And like, that yeah. is just so crazy to me. So I love that it does that. And it fills in these gaps and you do, you do sort of see a different life for Bruce, you know, you, if he would have not done the Batman thing and, and maybe thought that he got, you know, permission from his dead parents and, and moved on in a different direction, philanthropist, right. maybe like, you know, uh, helped fucking people who were down on their luck you know like did a lot of like um opening clinics and like things that you hear about him like if you devoted his life in that aspect to saving gotham yeah. what would gotham look like i mean you wouldn't have a joker you wouldn't have a riddler you wouldn't have you know like what whatever and, and it's kind of like it's just kind of a greek tragedy because it's like i'm of the firm belief that batman and all of his rogues gallery is just escalation and then and you know they, yeah. they see oh he's doing it i i can be better i, I can be worse than him like i'm not afraid yeah, of this exactly. fucking bad because for the first couple of years in, in batman chronologically like you know in the lore like it's just him like beating up people who rob people and then and then going after the mafia and then once he kind of chews through all that then the joker shows up and it's that yeah, theme, theme of, yeah. so at yeah, the yeah. at the tombstone if you would have heard yes bruce go be happy we wouldn't have i mean and, and it would suck because we wouldn't have batman but like for this you feel for that character that like man not <laughs> no. only are you you're about to mess up you're about to create this whole other world of super yeah. villains because they see you doing it you know so there is that exactly i agree <clears throat> and i'm glad that you brought up that it kind of uh fills in the blanks of his origins uh and stuff at least for the sake of this um mm -hmm. Because this movie was produced uh, between the first and second seasons of the series and follows Batman as he reconciles with a former lover, Andrea Beaumont, and faces a mysterious vigilante who is murdering Gotham City's crime bosses. Uh, and of course, the situation becomes even more complicated when the Joker enters the picture. Um, the, the plot partly mirrors Mike W. Barr's Batman Year Two comic book story arc, but features an original antagonist, the Phantasm, in place of the Reaper, while mm -hmm. also borrowing elements from Batman Year One graphic novel, recounting how Bruce Wayne became Batman in his first attempts to fight crime. Um, speaking on the uh, Phantasm, uh, what were your thoughts? I, I like to know what your thoughts were when you were a kid when you first saw this character in the movie, and if, if that all changed at all, you know, the older you got watching it, because it's a really cool creation, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. really like visually a really cool creation. And I guess you know when you watch the movie now, uh, as an adult, you're like, all right, not quite, you know, the villain of the piece either. You know, once you find out everything that's going sure. on, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, just a really like you said, you brought up that whole. Uh, the one sheet with the, the the original like cover art for like the poster and everything. That's the only thing about uh the 4K is that they changed that to Sorry, this do and that. doesn't look as good. And you'll be you'll be actually able to see this too because this episode will be on YouTube. You'll be one of the first oh, ones nice. on our uh, uh so yeah it doesn't look as cool. I mean I'm not gonna hate on the release because it is a cool release and it sure looks and sounds great. But I wish it had the original uh cover yeah. art yeah, that poster was wild. Uh, but yeah, that image of the phantasm is just so interesting. Yeah, so, and that image of the phantasm is just so interesting and cool. And I just kind of wanted to know mm -hmm. what you thought uh, when you first saw and then heard uh, phantasm <clears throat> speak. Oh man, so like I, I I love this villain. I'm I'm a I'm a huge fan of this villain, and I know like they sort of play it as a one and done. I mean, there there have been other appearances like in um. In, in animated like i know in like batman beyond she comes back or whatever um uh and i know that the action figure uh that they released completely spoiled the, the, the movie which is a huge, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A huge mis misstep um they should at least have had it over the head so that, that when you buy it you know yeah. but like that was so bad. Exactly. It was such a mess. Like <laughs> yeah. It's like That's the person hilarious. and then the costume. It's like, well, the the costume. I'm like, oh, fuck. No. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, so I, I love this villain. And like, I, I truly believe like the voice. I know they had Stacy Keach do the, do the like the uh uh what's the guy's name the, the first uh guy that gets killed I can't think of his name. Um, oh, uh, uh, Chucky's it's Chucky's all that no he's he, like, uh oh so well, Stacy Keach does the voice of Carl Beaumont uh, the, of of her uh of the the father dad. I believe yeah. yeah yeah and then also the voice of it. yeah yeah so he's like <laughs> it's like. It, the, the other piece of this is like it it's it's a little scary if you i mean if, if you're a yeah. kid even if you're an adult like you, you know the guys in the parking lot and you just hear this chucky saw you know it's yeah. like, like, <laughs> like like okay what you know so i i love it and I, and I love that it's based on you know a little a little based on the reaper right like from like, those, yeah 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 from those comics uh yeah. is that is that an 80s comic or 70s yeah uh well, 80s 80s 80. So, and the Reaper in the comics looks so disturbing, which is great. And so yeah. this was the, their version. They kind of, you know, kind of tooled around obviously and did different things. But I, I think this villain is so underrated. I loved the twist with it, with the reveal of who it really was. Um, it, it, it then again makes you want to go back and rewatch it because there's so many plot points that makes sense after you find out who it is. And I think, yeah. you know, like it, it, it's creepy. Like we all love like a father death, like grim reaper kind of a figure, but Batman's never had one like in that, um, in that zone, like, you know, on the animated show. And so this was yeah. their first time introducing that. And like, who better for Batman to go against than another vigilante that's dressed like the fucking Grim Reaper, you know? So I think like that. Yeah. 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 That that's so, so brilliant. And I think, you know, they were worried that, Oh, it's a new villain. We have to get the Joker in there. Cause originally the Joker wasn't part of it. And, and they're like, well, we have to have some familiar face yeah. in there or whatever. And, and, and it wound up working really well, but I mean, I, I, I will go on record and say that I think, the phantasm is one of his greatest foes or villains or, or whatever. And then I think, um, no. yeah, I'm, I'm going to hold on to the bombshell until we talk a little bit more about it. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, I was, when I was watching it, I was trying to, cause I think when I was younger, when the reveal happens, I think I was more like it was very much like, <gasps> like I was like deeply shocked, and then I'm like, oh, and, then, and then watching it now as an adult, and I was like, oh, I guess they do like plant seeds and it's her, yeah, because <laughs> you're not because you're not really looking for it when you're a kid, but it was like a complete shock as a child, and like, oh wow, it was her, um, and and they come, you know, when you I guess when you're a kid, you don't think because they're obviously setting it up to be like the story that she's telling is like, oh, it's definitely her father like i mean it might like it's yeah he's the one doing this right so yeah. I've, I've already like as a child like i've accepted the dialogue i'm hearing like it must be the dad it had like why who else would it be and i'm not thinking about all the little like little seeds they planted that gives you a hint that like oh no this is her um and then i'm watching when i was watching for this i was like oh i guess it is it's obvious that but i mean a good like a good solid you know misdirection you know for uh animated movie i don't even call it a children's animated movie because i don't think it is but it I, I think they do a good job of like not totally playing their hand until they absolutely have to and, and especially because how they set her up to that you don't really mm -hmm. think that she would be you know parading at night and you know that costume like she doesn't give off uh that vibe until she starts one i think when i watched it how you know it was how so upset upset accepting she was of uh you know when they have to rescue bruce and you know after <laughs> I, I forgot how like they were shooting at him all willy-nilly in those scenes when they were like uh <laughs> you know when they almost like blew him up and like a bunch of other uh -huh. stuff um you know she you don't really get the vibe about her until you know she is doesn't really seem phased by a lot of the stuff that she's kind of seeing but mm -hmm. then again you know she is kind of like her dad was in a nefarious character so she was used to <laughs> being around nefarious people so i guess that could be why she is so like good with like what she's seeing and hearing but you know at at first though you don't really get him she seems pretty soft it doesn't yeah. seem like you know she would not be uh that character at all so i just remember being completely shocked as a child that it was like that and then the thing with the joker i was trying to figure out for this if i felt like he was 
shoehorned in or if it was a natural uh natural story in narrative like necessity to include him and i guess i guess you can never get enough uh mark hamill doing the voice of joker and that's that's always fun um i still don't know how i feel if it if they if they feels like he's just kind of like forced in there because that you it does feel like he is put in just so like the viewers have a familiar villain uh that they are associated with that they already know mm-hmm. um and not to say that it's like he he's out of place like i still think how the way they use him is it works for the movie but yeah yeah i'm still, I'm still struggling with that a little bit i mean it 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 does but if you think so the so these Andrea Beaumont and Bruce Wayne like went to college together right? or high school or college. Right. But they actually meet in a cemetery and Bruce is like, you know, brooding over his parents' grave and then walks over and sees Andrea Beaumont having this like lovely conversation as, as <laughs> some humans do with, yeah. with her, with her dead mother, you know, and the fact that they meet in a cemetery is so like, so well written right and then yeah. the relate the relationship evolves from there and then when you find out that andrew beaumont whom bruce was going to marry right just before, yeah. like there's there's all of this other stuff happening like that's he proposes to her and then just before or just after like that's how he like the, where he took her is like he discovers the bat cave so it's like these choices yeah. are presented to him over and over and over again and then come to find out that she's the phantasm right she's the one under the reaper mask yeah and and then have the greatest batman foe of all time show up but show up in a way where i think in continuity it was the joker who do we know in batman animated series con- continuity if the joker killed bruce's parents um i I know they do that in the 89 movie. I'm trying sure. to see if they do that on the show. I don't think they do on the show. I, I'll, I'll, I will look into that while we're doing this. While you're talking yeah. So, so you have this person who is a love interest who he's almost going to give up on being the Batman to be with this woman and have a happy life. Right. But then her father gets bumped off right and so yeah. she becomes this vigilante who does kill <clears throat> and goes after the mafia and then what i think is interesting with your joker point which i'm leading up to i promise um is that you have these two people who are in love both wearing masks both vigilantes both going after criminals and then you have the one person who's ruined bruce's life the most right and yeah. ruined her her life the most by taking her father and she's she does or tries to do what bruce could never and i think that is so interesting to me that she's willing to kill the joker and he's not and yet we when this is the eternal debate among, amongst batman fans like should he just whack the guy or what and then and you right. know i think like in in um some of uh you know batman the dark knight returns like or uh the comic book like the, the joker does die eventually and it's violent and it's not necessarily at batman's hands but it's close and so she does this thing that he's not able to do and there's her there's him both their lives are full of trauma and tragedy and there's one person standing in between them as a little cameo it's like hey i, I pretty much caused you guys to be <laughs> to, to be the way you are I <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and then and then she takes him and fucking you know we what we what we you know what they want us to think like she she tries to fully go through and, and kill him um yeah, yeah i think i think that's a really interesting play a really interesting point because they're the same person you know in terms of the loss and the, and, and putting on a mask at night and beating the shit out of people she kills he doesn't and then there's his greatest foe her greatest foe and she just i love that when she grabs onto them and the smoke spirals around them and they just disappear yeah. it's the, coo- it's the coolest shit ever. Yeah, yeah yeah i think i think what's interesting is that they both have they're both working with this whole duality uh uh thing as well and you know and th- like she even throws it in his face when he basically is like you know you don't have to do this and she's basically like you know kind of you're one to talk because you're doing it 
too. But you know, the difference between the two of them, I guess, he still has his humanity because he, you know, he, um, he has a line that he won't cross, and mm -hmm. clearly, uh, you know, as we saw when she is a phantasm and she's bumping off these crime figures, she is cool with crossing that line because. Yeah whatever humanity she had in her, they took that away. I mean, when, you know, all stuff happened with her father. So I think that's the, I think that's the interesting thing that there's a difference between them, even though they are one and the same and, mm -hmm. you know, they, they've chosen to take on these identities to uh, take on these, uh, these bad guys and all that. They just have different methods of doing it. And then that is the key difference is that he still has his humanity and she clearly doesn't. Mm -hmm. And, and I thought that was like really interesting. And I, I loved when those walls were kind of broken down. Like when, like once it's like, once he's seen that this is who, you know, he knows it's her and all that she really does like for the next few moments of the film, like drops all the kind of sensitive pretenses that she's kind of had uh, in their interactions beforehand. Like she basically is like, no, this is how this is going to go. And yeah. I think that's yeah, yeah, yeah. She and that's where you can really tell that she is not, uh, you know, she is a much darker place than Bruce Wayne has mm -hmm. ever been up to that point, which makes them that is what makes them so fundamentally different, even though it seems like they are one of the same in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I think, and and that that to me is the true story of these people that are they're crisscrossing, they lose each other. But then they come back together. But then did they really lose each other? Because they kind of both chose to do this this vigil to wear a mask, right? I, I know the original right. title of the, of the film was supposed to be uh, Batman Masks, which I thought was really interesting. But like Mask mm -hmm. of the Phantasm obviously has a better ring to it. Ring to it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I think the fact that she does what, what Batman's not capable of doing by taking the Joker, by killing the Joker, whatever we're going to say. Uh, we all yeah. know he survives a uh, fucking spoiler alert. And so does she yeah, yeah. spoiler alert. But I also think yep. it's interesting <laughs> that like, you know, Andrea and Bruce's first date is at like uh, the world of tomorrow or whatever. And it's sort of like they go to this like world's fairy kind of a place where it, you know, they take a little, uh, little like, roller coaster ride through like this representation of like where gotham is you know and this is and they're in college and they're young there is no joker yet the mobs runs deep but gotham hasn't become the gotham we know and so it's like right. this representation of like what a beautiful beautiful future could be right and that's where the final confrontation goes down is this decrepit uh destroyed version of the place where they had their first date and it's yeah. like him it's like her and the uh, fucking joker it does not get any more well written than that in terms of like psych psych you know like psychologically if we're talking about trauma if we're talking about you know ptsd i think because it happened to her when she was an adult with the father getting clipped her PTSD is still raw and she's still, you know, Bruce had his, had his whole life to brood and, and, you know, and sort of come to terms with it. And, and obviously he never comes to terms with it and he's dressed like a no, fat no. Beat, beating people up. But for her, of course, she's going to be more violent, right? These people only yeah. understand, only understand violence. These people only understand um, pain and hurt. So as an adult, I think, she's at a disadvantage because she's just going to put on the costume and, and start murdering. Right. Which, you know, if, if that happened to a child, yeah. it's not as easy for, you know, a kid to put on a fucking, unless you're Michael Myers, but that's a whole other episode. And so, um, I just think, you know, that there's something to be said about her, her, her wounds are more fresh than Bruce's. I, I agree. And I also, I also thought it was interesting too, because I think, um, Batman Returns tried to draw these parallels too, but maybe not as effectively because you have that mm -hmm. you have that kind of I think it's like one or two moments with Catwoman and him mm -hmm. where uh one is where they're at that ball and they they're dancing and they kind of do the whole mistletoe uh dialogue exchange and then they just and then they both realize that like oh they've had that <laughs> exchange before but when yeah. they were in full like you know costume and um and then they have that moment where she starts crying and she's like, does that mean that we have to start fighting? And then like, he kind of holds her and they're just going to leave together. And most likely 
talk until the penguin like you know crashes the party and sure uh turns everything to shit and then they have that moment again towards uh towards the end where you know that like she is gonna she wants to kill max shrek like she's like this is not you know this person destroyed my life and he's trying to convince her not to you know in, in certain ways to like kind of save her humanity it's not as like maybe as well written and you know as detailed as this but it like sure I love I love watching the two differences with how like th- that was presented. I think it's it's definitely more fleshed out uh, here. Yeah, where you're right. Like you're right. Like you know, like once that once that duality is discovered, right? You know, it's the moment of like, oh, how far gone is she? <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's clear that she's pretty far gone, and like she has her reasons, and like he already knows why because uh, he's figured out, uh, you know, everything that's you know why she's taking up that mantle and all that. And it's much more, like you said, like, I think fresh for her cause she's an adult mm-hmm. and, and she's had to deal with that trauma as a fully fledged, fully formed adult that knows that like knows right from wrong. And then the kind of is in control of at least of what she chooses to do as a child. You're like, okay, how do I get through this? <laughs> what do I do? How do I fight this as an adult? She's like, okay, I have, I can have the resources to fight it the way I want to fight it. Mm-hmm. And that's what she chooses to do. And I, I think it's kind of, inter- I think it's interesting too, because I, when I was watching it, I was like, they have that moment after he, he essentially almost, he almost dies. Like he gets hurt badly and they save him. She picks him up. She saves him. And they come to this kind of come to Jesus moment about who they are, at mm-hmm. least, at least who he is. And uh, if she's not being 100% honest yet, and yeah. and you kind of think like okay like if they does she believe they can try again and in her mind is like I just got to get rid of like this one like final <laughs> one guy yeah yeah <laughs> and like in, in her mind it's like I wonder if it's like if once I get rid of him yeah we can totally be happy together or if she kind of knows it like that or she just kind of saying it in hopes of like making herself believe it or if she does believe it if she's like hey yeah. like, we can have we can have what we want as soon as i knock off this last person that's responsible mm-hmm. for uh you know all the trauma i've been going through i thought that all that stuff was pretty uh interesting yeah. too I, I mean you're you're dead on and I, <clears throat> the way i get it is i think i think she would have hung it up to be on to be honest with you i i, I really yeah. do because you just get that vibe that it was just vengeance on a, on a certain few. Whereas like with Bruce, right. like he, you know, he just is out every night, just like yeah. pummeling, pummeling somebody for stealing a, whatever. And like, I think, you know, also it's probably important. And again, this is just my sort of take on it is Bruce is responsible for the creation of the, of the phantasm in a way, in the same way that he's responsible, like for the Joker, right? Like big, he had been in a mask running around and there, all these villains had popped up for a year or two. And like, do you think that, I mean, wh- why couldn't it just be, she's got a couple of guns in her purse, you know, <laughs> yeah. she, she, she slinks in the office and blows her brains out and nobody knows anything, right? You no, know, she had to dress up, right? And so where'd she get that idea, you think? You know, yeah, like, to, oh, there's a bat to this, like intimate To create this intimidating figure, yeah. Yeah, to really make it stick, to make it, she adopted that, like, let's scare the living terror out of them and then kill them, right? And so I think yeah. there's there's a there's a sort of a, a narrative string there. And again, like, you know, we all have dark sides and we all have choices at, at how we embrace them. I lean into mine sometimes for fun. I mean, I'm not out at night fucking breaking people's <laughs> n- necks in Next. Chicago or whatever, or whatever, but um, a little bit more, it, a little bit more dangerous out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not, not even that. It's just like, it, well, first of all, Chicago, you walk around Chicago and you're like, I'm in Gotham. This is wild. Like literally right. You know, I have a train on a platform running like right next to me which like yeah. which is crazy it's, it, and it is very gotham-esque and they, they've shot a lot of the movies here and whatever but like i think you know we we do we, we do have a choice like as to how we embrace our dark sides and i don't think they should be ignored and i don't think they should be you know our trauma should be at front of mind or else it'll take control of you in the back of mind and we we love batman and we love um you know this phantasm character or whatever but like 
they're kind of letting the 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 fucking the gremlins run the run the ship right like um yeah. and that's an that's another point is these are two adults who have res, you know resorted to violence to make themselves feel better yeah. about their trauma and revenge and you know i'm a fan of revenge i think it's great again it, it just it, it's so amazing to me that this animated film was able to tackle um such themes of of trauma for two adults that that res if you watch it and you you watch it the right way you'll see that these are two people who are suffering greatly and they could have helped each other but instead you know they yeah. kind of they kind of fucking chose another path yeah, no, it's, and i also yeah. love too she is like a total the same as him in a lot of ways because like she's not she's not a meta human like some of the other uh people in the dc universe she is mm -hmm. a trained fighter like that she even surprises like bruce at one point with how like good she is and like even in their initial kind of like kind of like fun little meat cutes with each other yeah <laughs> um uh and you know and she's taking on these other like how she's able to create phantasm as a whole is like it's, mm -hmm. it's almost as, it's the same exact way as he created uh batman it's a lot of like smoke and mirrors <laughs> really that they both became really good at and um i remember when my friend first saw this he was like do they really fully explain how she comes up with all this stuff i was like i the, the <laughs> fighting the fighting we saw yeah you know, she but even though she doesn't really need to fight as the phantasm doesn't really do a lot of that sure. and you know everything else this is like you know she's i they make it clear that she's She's smart. She's a critical thinker. She, you know, if you had all this time to really hone in on one, let all that vengeance like fester while you're mm -hmm. trying to create this other thing that you want to uh, use as a way of striking fear into your enemies. Like mm -hmm. she, you could tell, she would definitely have the time, much like Batman, to create this other persona and it'd be completely realistic that she has honed all of these skills, necessary skills to make that work. So I never, uh, yeah, questioned it at all. No, and neither did I, right? And it's like, <clears throat> um, it's Gotham. I'm sure there's a fucking disappearing smoke dealer on every corner. <laughs> right. number, number one, <laughs> um, but number two, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's super viable. You know, I think, I think that for this film, they just, I think they swung big and they went for like this scary ass fucking villain and i think that works so well in this movie and, and it's weird to me that they never used the character as much i mean man you know the other the other point before i go into that let me just make this point real quick is that yeah one if you go watch bruce has a thing for red for for dysfunctional redhead women so like <laughs> like like that woman throws a drink on him at the party she's a redhead oh right? yeah like like Andrea Beaumont, yeah. she's a redhead, right? It's a little dysfunctional, and and she also is yeah. wearing like the same earrings yeah. as as Bruce's uh, mother, and they they keep showing the portrait of the parents, and then Andrea, whatever. So he's like trying to trying to fix yeah. that, trying to like kind of you know mommy yeah. issue, daddy issues too, but like she sort of represents, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, she sort of represents that. And and so I thought that was very, very interesting because yeah. it's like this track that runs alongside of everything that's going on. That like he kind of was like dating a woman that all these women that sort of resemble his mom a little bit. <laughs> mom, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Do, do, do you, yeah. whatever. But she's like Andrea is actually wearing the same earrings as as the, the yeah. uh, as the Martha in the painting, which is crazy. Um, and that's yeah. totally on purpose, obviously, because he saw himself, you know, with yeah. her and a family and 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 whatever um you know we've had you know the animated series gave gave us harley quinn you know and now um margot robbie has made harley quinn you know that was the first live action harley quinn technically i, I yeah. guess and then now yeah. lady gaga is about to do harley quinn and so like harley quinn's like in popular culture right and and this is yeah. where i'll give you this is where i'll give you the bombshell okay. um I think it's time. It's well overdue that Andrea Beaumont and 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 the Phantasm that they get their their moment in the darkness, right? As as it were, right? I think that and 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 again, I'm going to do what I did on the Michael Mann episode. If you ever interview uh, uh, Matt Reeves, I think mm -hmm. I think 
that they should have Andrea Beaumont or, or whomever under the phantasm mask as the big bad, not in the next the Batman film, but probably the third and have it be like this mirror image. Like imagine a Matt Reeves version that looks more like the Reaper than the phantasm. Right. Yeah. And, and it's, it's the rain soaked Matt Reeves, really reality grounded driven thing that, that then can become like, well, you're doing it. You know, I'm, I'm whatever. And there's a love yeah. triangle between Andrea Beaumont and, and Zoe Kravitz's Catwoman. I, and I just think it could be, it's time. And I think that if you really yeah. want to, if you really want to throw the gauntlet down and like do like a legendary Batman like film, I think you gotta, I think Matt Reeves has got to bring the phantasm in for for a on camera villain. I mean, just imagine how scary that would look and what the repercussions would be of someone that he's in love with uh and and is in as much pain as he is that's just brutal and dark and violent and not afraid to kill. I mean, that that's a story I want to see. That actually would be cool and I think that I would think that over the years of this character, I mean it's viewed as like a pretty underrated Batman villain and I but I think that fanboys love the interpretation of, of the Phantasm character and mm -hmm. love what that character represents I think it would work in live action I would love to see it in live action um, now I guess the only playing devil's advocate I think the only the only problem with it and there, there's no <laughs> real problem is convincing the casual movie goer like well who is this um, sure. and, and you know like and that's the only thing that However, if I was making the movie, I would just be like, hey, we can like we'll promote it in the way where they'll think this villain is so cool that they won't really care that it's not the Joker. It's not two face. It's not whoever. Um, I yeah, yeah, I would love to see that because I think there'd be I think there'd be a good story there, especially if it it you know, it, it involves someone that he's in love with and then that what and then struggling what to do uh, in live action for with, you know, with that information once he figures out like who she sure. is I and mean, then you can go it can go even darker too uh than you know what they do in this animated movie so yeah mm -hmm. there's like a lot of potential there and like the fact that we haven't really i mean i know they like you said they use the character again on batman beyond but i would love uh to see this character pop up again in a major way in yeah some major batman uh lore and the live action ones of the i know that it's probably even for warner brothers they'll be like uh well <laughs> no one knows who that no one knows who it is um but i don't know i i would make an argument that a lot of people do and then that is where then that's where good marketing comes in you make people know who you either make people understand who the character is are you are you shrouded in so much mystery that they're intrigued by who it is and they want to find out yeah i mean and think about like and and you know go into your role dex in your brain of who would be a good andrea Boma that's emotional and like like that kind of like you know, traumatic acting, like whatever. And I'll even go, take it a step further because they always change things around for the movies. And I love that because it keeps it fresh. Maybe we think it's Andrea Boma the whole movie and Andrea Boma gets killed by the phantasm and it's somebody else. But bring that, br bring that character, yeah. like have the switch. Yeah. Have the love <laughs> triangle between Selena Kyle and Andrea Beaumont, have Andrea Beaumont be tortured, have him starting to, you know, pick up that, Oh shit, this phantasm fucker that I'm, I'm fighting on the top of the train every night is, it, is it, there's no way, but it all makes sense. It's Andrea Beaumont. So he calls her, she shows up, they have this heated discussion phantasm shows up sing sing kills it kills whatever <laughs> maybe she was involved with it i mean what you could do so many things with it and i think if you give that to a matt reeves i i think that this phantasm character like it really it gets its its day you know finally that character yeah but like i mean it's weird to me that 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 people haven't i think she's been in a couple comic books i think you know i think they actually introduced her into mainline continuity in the batman comics but like then you have this reaper piece from the 80s that yeah. may, maybe it follows more of that kind of a thing and it's more based on the phantasm but i just think dude that would be one hell of a uh, you know, and if you if you want Barry Keoghan in there to fucking get in between them and cause some shit, there you go. Like yeah. it's all it's all there. I I think I think 
you know, the writing on Mask of the Phantasm and the the level of of adult uh, trauma, PTSD, like really emotional suffering, uh, and this Phantasm character, it just it just hasn't gotten the level of appreciation that it deserves. And so, yeah. what better way, right? And then, like, I mean, why do you think they just didn't do like a direct video? See, I mean, we would have taken anything take, with that character. I would have taken, and they would have done well on home video. Granted, like, since Mass of the Phantasm did really well on home video, you know what yeah. it kind of reminds me of? Everybody, like, to have like a one off villain like this that it, it looks so cool and it's so visually arresting, it kind of reminds me of how George Lucas chose to use Darth Maul. In episode one, where it's just like the cool, it's a cool look, it's a cool looking villain only in like a what a handful of scenes, gets that one big fight scene at the end, right? And then he, he dies, he killed him, they kill him <laughs> off at the end of, of episode one, right? And then yeah. but he's used, used all over the marketing, right? Because it's a cool, he's a cool looking image, mm -hmm. and and I feel like that's and but like much, much more cooler, and I know. In subsequent, they, they've they've done more stuff with Darth Maul, but like initially, sure. that's what it felt like. It was just to be like this one off thing, and like that was it. It's weird that something, and it, that it feels iconic to me, like that the imagery of the Phantasm feels iconic. The character itself feels iconic. That it's weird that it was just a one off. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, I know we got her again in Batman Beyond, uh, but like I felt like we could have used. I mean, having Andrea Beaumont come back at some point during the run of the animated series would have been cool to see because, um, you know, she survives and mm -hmm. uh, and that would have been, I think that would have been great. I think it's so interesting that uh, that it is a one-off villain and that's it. That that's Yeah. It. it doesn't get any more it's, Gotham than that. No, you're right. I, I agree. And it's unfortunate because it's, it's, I mean, I mean, uh, I guess on the other hand, it's like, hey, like, fans know it's like it's this one piece of really cool iconic imagery and character work for this one particular project and you know i, I guess we should be appreciative that we got the one but i think there was more yeah. to be done there i mean there, there's a lot to explore that kind of that and how that duality of that relationship would have grown had he believed that like oh she you know she's she's dead she's gone whatever and then mm -hmm. to have her come back and and see how much she has changed and she's since even their last encounter, like is she sure. even more far gone? Is she even more far gone, or has she kind of found some inner peace, or like whatever it is? Uh, it would have been interesting to see where their characters would have met again at a certain point, at least in the original run of the anime. Yeah, series, like I mean, she never even. Yeah, she never even popped up on the show, which is like weird. And that you know, at the end of the film, we see her on a boat talking to some doofus. You know what I mean? And so she, so she, <laughs> who's she trying to, who like <laughs> is drawn to look like he's about to hit on her? I is like the yeah. way they drew him. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah, he's a like creepy ass fucking mouth and shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Well, I think you know, I think it, it, it's weird because. I, you know, if you and if you and me are sitting around and someone's like, hey, guys, like you have 15 minutes to come up with a sequel pitch, like easy. Andrea Beaumont comes back. Bruce and her. He retires as Batman. They're living a happy life. And then all of a sudden yep. there's copycats of the Phantasm. Right. And so Batman Mask of the Phantasms. <laughs> And then there's your, know, there's right? your direct <laughs> video sequel. It probably won't be that great, but it, at least we get something, you know, like yeah. to have her just shove off literally on a boat. And then she has sporadic appearances every 15 years in comics is really kind of yeah. sad, you know? Yeah, it is. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I like if we're sitting around thinking of how they can use the character again, I, I'm sure these creatives, I wonder if they even thought about like, yeah, let's see how we can like utilize it. And they actually know know what they're doing, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, imagine just imagine what a Matt Reeves version would just look like, and then imagine what it would yeah. sound like. <laughs> like, like you know, we, we wouldn't have the smoke and all that stuff, obviously. But like Batman in that opening, that opening scene to the Batman twenty twenty two, like the music that's just building, and 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 you know, like he's using the darkness as sort of like these portals almost so like you suck people in they don't know where i'm at but whatever same yeah do the same scene but just do it about the phantasm you know what i mean and it's like because yeah. they're like sort of mirror images of each other and you know what is 
we're going to see in the next couple of films, you know, how Batman deals with escalation and how he deals with, okay, we kind of trust you. We probably won't arrest you now. Like just keep doing good. And maybe he has a couple wins. I'm sure he'll have some big losses, but then what do you do when yeah. you're, you, you kind of feel like you have, you have come into your own as this, this creature of the night and some fucking asshole shows up dressed as father death. And he, <laughs> yeah. but, but he's only, but this person's only killing criminals. How do you battle that? How do you fight yourself? You know, a harder, yeah. tougher, tougher version of yourself. And I think that, that could be really cool. Yeah, I agree. I do like um, the fact that even when they, the reasons, well, when they decided to go theatrical, they gave them a little bit more money. And uh, I just wanted to comment on the opening uh, of the movie, the opening title sequence, which is like a completely like computer generated version of Gotham City with the score. Uh, Shirley Walker does the score for the movie. Um, I, mean, it, I mean, it's all very reminiscent of like the kind of Elfman scores that we got from like 89 and uh, Returns. But mm. um, I totally forgot how epic her opening music. Well, actually, the music throughout the whole thing is really good. But that opening uh, title sequence uh, with her music is so, so good. Probably yeah. like some of the best pieces of like Batman music I've ever heard. And uh, I just wanted to shout that out because I, I totally forgot about it. Like I, when I popped it in, I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot it starts like this. And it was blaring through my surround sound. And it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it is. And also, I watched a thing last night um, just to brush up even further. Um, and that opening score is actually all of the um, all of the musicians names run and sung backwards. Oh, that's cool. So I like the kind of like Latin, like li the sounding lyrics that. Oh, that's, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And just to make sure it got through, she included all the producers and directors at Warner Brothers, <laughs> too. And, and she won and she won it. She, she they got it to stick. It, it stayed in the movie, which is really cool. Yeah, really that, cool. that opening music is so good it's very i mean it, i mean it kind of sets the tone that this is a i mean not just a taking the animated series from tv and putting it on the like, they wanted to show that this is, is cinematic mm -hmm. and not just the tv series transferred over to the big screen uh yeah. which there could have you know that could have easily been the case too because you know they could have just been like hey like we'll just release it you know we'll just cut together like three half hour episodes and make a movie and yeah. uh but but no that opening kind of shows exactly uh what that intention was and it's so it's so big and so good like i was thinking to myself because i the opening crawl to 89 batman is probably tops as far mm -hmm. as that's concerned but then i was thinking about batman returns and then this after i listened to this and because batman returns actually has a really cool opening uh like danny elf's music is a little bit more gothic and a little bit different uh mm -hmm. in for the opening of batman returns but i actually liked hearing this like a bit more than the second movie i, I don't know if i could ever get anything to top the opening oh man that opening of, uh, 89 one. batman yeah but like, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> but yeah perfect. that music Just was amazing insane. yeah no i mean and even like even the animated show the music is just fire. <laughs> like, it's like, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, just, <laughs> they just like, they were like, okay, we're going to make like, this is for kids, but it's also like for adults. Like, and that, yeah. you know, all, all that stuff with the gray ghost and like what, I, like, you know, oh, they, another good episode. Yep. Dude. Yeah. It's just like, there's so much to, to mine there. And it took them too long to get Harley Quinn into the mainstream. Like, don't wait on this phantasm thing the gray ghost thing like that the, <clears throat> you know they really pulled off the look of and it feels a bit on steroids like uh because they they do in this film they do show you little like more adult corners right of um yeah. of gotham that they don't show you in the show in the film yeah. and in the film like the first thing you see right is this casino like, oh we're gambling and okay yeah and the yeah. name of the casino is the shady lady which is just yeah, tells yeah, you yeah. what's about to happen in the movie so it's like oh it's true yeah yeah no it's it's, <laughs> it's it's so cool man it's like they gave them a little blood they let you knock the joker's teeth out they killed a couple people like whatever yeah and then they gave you like these more adult embezzlement casino mob murder I mean, there's guns, you know, like, and they're actually shooting at arteries, not at the sky, you know, like, yeah, yeah. And, and it's like, 
it, it was very cool. And it, it, it makes you wonder, you know, had this been a critical, let's just say it made four times what they, what, what the budget made, was, yeah. right? They, they, yeah. they pulled in 25 million. I mean, what do you think would have happened? I wonder if that would have, that probably would have been enough for them, I guess, like a $6 million budget. Yeah, I mean, they. I am assuming they were hoping for. Again, I just wonder when they realized what the writing was on the wall. They they, they gave it its little Christmas Day release, and they were like, "Okay, this is not going to do what we thought it was going to do." And it feels like they just immediately like pulled it like right away as soon mm-hmm. as they realized that. I think they said it made like one point two million within its first two days, and then they were just like, "Uh," and just they probably let it like slog along through the end of the year, and then yeah, like, just but they just pulled it and yeah. and that's crazy and like you know i like i said like they said from start to finish the film was completed within eight months and that is like i said like we said for animated project is not a lot of time at all and i and joe in terms of like promoting it um i i i don't even know if like i don't know what time of the year would have been the best i don't know if christmas day was the best time to it's probably not re- re- <laughs> to release it i mean there there, of course there's some dark stuff that does well on christmas and animated movies do well on christmas day Mm -hmm. but in 1993 i don't think that was the case would have been the case for something like this um i I just don't understand when like a studio puts like they're like hey we're gonna do this on home video but then they're like hey no we're gonna give you a lot more money and we're gonna release it theatrically then why not give it the tools necessary to succeed and then instead of just cutting it off of the kneecaps i just it's always been strange to me that you're gonna put more money in something and then not give it the tools it needs to succeed that's what was strange about the whole release pattern of the yeah and and not to mention that you have the show of which the movie is taking place in uh running currently that's running you could just <laughs> yeah, fucking yeah. blow it up yeah. like you can have every station that's like we're, we're doing a marathon countdown in celebration of i mean it, it seems like a no-brainer and you think in 89 they would have I, I think truly batman returns like was a punch to the fucking balls for, for for warner brothers because that really seemed to mess them up because the the marketing <laughs> strategy know. the marketing strategy that we see kevin feige run it's the same playbook as batman 89 right and like to, yeah to, to, to merchandise to have like again one of the one of the one of the, the the things that affected my life as a creator the most was just the fact that the marketing for batman 89 was just a fucking bat symbol and no it's name. still and it's still the template for how you market a big Tent pole release. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm so excited to because like Jackson's never seen. Uh, don't, everyone don't hate him. I, he's mentioned on the show before. He's never <laughs> seen Batman eighty nine, and this will be the first year that he sees it because it'll be thirty five in June. And what I can't wait to talk about with him when we talk about that movie is mm-hmm. just how important that marketing campaign was. Mm-hmm. And like you said, how it starts so simple because it's just that simple. In the beginning, yep. it's just and I mean, it's just like, I mean, it, it's that symbol says so much, yeah. But it that I mean, they were just like, we're just gonna, we're, I mean, <laughs> we're not gonna really give an indication of like what the style is. It's, it's my hint at what the style is because this looks like a little different from where what you were mm-hmm. even accustomed to, even with the symbol. And we're gonna mm-hmm. show you that, and I think they did too. They cut, they had like that little like trailer cut together before like the movie was completely done, and then that was yeah. another thing that they used to sell it and. It really, it really did become like the, the, the one that we continue to use today on how to market it. And my thing with Batman Returns, I always got the visual of there was a bunch of people in the offices, and Tim Burton was like, "I don't know if I want to come back." And they're like, "Well, we want you to. You made us a, you made us a hit movie." And then he was like, "You know what? I'll come back if you give me complete creative control." And I just imagine them not paying attention, just like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You do whatever you want." yeah yeah like not I looking mean... at his dailies not doing anything not even pay not paying attention to like a thing that what he was doing and then they didn't really know what he was doing until they saw it with the mm-hmm. rest of everyone it was like oh <laughs> that's yeah <laughs> that's how i imagine that all went down because i can't imagine them like being oh i can't no. imagine the studio being completely okay with like i mean i i love batman returns i think it's it's good in its own right but like i can't imagine the way they had to have known that parents are going to be like okay this is 
not what we expected. It's not sure. like 89 isn't dark. I mean, it's dark. It's dark in a different way. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly, but you know, there's dark and then there's like Tim Burton dark. And Tim, this is like Batman Returns is very much a Tim Burton movie, but I just really don't think they were paying attention to what he was doing. Yeah, not at all. And I think, honestly, I think he was like, I'm Tim Burton and like I'm the shit and like I don't care because like if and I to be honest with you like I really Batman Returns angers me because it could have been a really dope film right but instead you have uh, you have Bruce Wayne who's like this smart like kind of like um aloof kind of a guy like give Knox a grant and all that kind of like whatever right yeah, yeah. in the in the first one and in the second one he's like literally slobbering over himself over selena kyle he kind of acts like a fucking idiot when he meets her the first couple times the fu- wayne manor is a different wayne manor and there's no explanation at all like it's just a different house on a cliff like you know and so the Danny DeVito as the penguin, the guy's like in a little race car at the end and the clown, I mean, whatever. And so <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, there's some interesting things that like the circus originally, like the clowns were written to be the leftovers from Joker's gang that right. penguin took over. Got it. Cool. But then why is this so cheesy? Like Michelle Pfeiffer <laughs> iconic is, I mean, I mean, yeah. dude, you know, if there's I, anything in that movie that works, it's her, <laughs> but I, I think on the marketing I think they're like, oh my God, we set a new precedent. So much so that we don't have enough action figures to sell. We got to reprint the old 70s toys for 89. It works so good. Let's let's duplicate it for Batman Returns. And it was working, working, working. And then the penguin, you know, goo out of the mouth and McDonald's got scared and then whatever. And so yeah. I think they were doubting themselves when they when they went to market phantasm because i think they're like uh i don't know how much money we want to spend on this or like whatever but we don't know what this is going to do because it did come out after batman Returns. so i think they were kind of like not confident and i think that probably affected yeah, it. i think so too so i just pulled up something from the omniplex podcast and they were speculating why the film didn't do well because they were like like uh, film got really good reviews upon release uh, even though it took eight months from start to finish uh, by all accounts to everyone that worked on it the production was still pleasant though it wasn't like they uh, didn't like working on it um, the one uh, button point they put in it says it, it begins with a trailer they said I've never seen a less coherent trailer in my life all that it tells <laughs> you is that there is a Batman animated movie coming there's none of the big set pieces there's no plot there's ba- there's probably as much text as animation and it tells you right away nobody at the studio knew what they had they mm-hmm. talk about the film coming out on Christmas, uh, on Christmas day uh, they say on the same day uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Grumpy Old Men was out which was actually dominating <laughs> the box office then uh, and that <laughs> massive phantasm was third in line for them because the Pelican Brief was also out, and mm. uh, there were a few other movies that were dominating the box office as well. And then uh, they say Warner Brothers decided to not screen it for critics in advance, uh, and and they said that um, as you might guess, the film is now critic beloved. It has an eighty five percent positive score on uh, Rotten Tomatoes, and Cisco and Eber loved it, but said they wish they would have seen it, had a chance to see it theatrically. They didn't get to see it until it came out on home video. Wow. And Cisco and, and Cisco actually said it was um, above Batman Returns and slightly below eighty nine when he saw it. And then they also said, and then there's the botch exposition. This is not on WB; it's on theaters. Why is this movie only shown mostly during the day? It did. Mm-hmm. It did a random sample of several newspapers. It paid. Oh, uh, they uh, during a random sample of na- newspapers they found during that time. It played past seven p.m. at one theater in Little Rock, none in Pittsburgh, and only twice in Houston. That's the release. Jets is the movie got, and that movie bombed as well. <laughs> uh, and then they said the. Co- <laughs> Um, and then they said, actually, the core problem, which is could be why we also love it so much, though, is Batman Massive Phantasm isn't a kid's movie. It's played fine to them, sure, but it's not a kid's movie. It's a deeply adult film. For one thing, the plot is heavy on double crosses and a lot of very dull details kids don't necessarily get. But mostly the film is so deeply nihilistic and bleak. It's about the ethics of killing. It plays becoming Batman as a literal horror. Look, the adult films play at being mature, but the film says trauma will ruin you. And no matter what you do, unless you learn to move on from it, you're destroyed. And it places Batman, an iconic superhero, hard uh, in the latter. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of it, there's a lot of reasons why it could have completely bombed uh, then. And there was yeah. some, and there are some good points to be made about um, 
I didn't realize they didn't screen it for critics when they came out. That is wow. Also insane. Yeah, no, that's that's that is insane. Well, and I think you know we're learning now. And, and I, you know, in the in the set, well, more in the fifties and sixties, forties, whatever. Like they just they took Batman out of you know the the original stuff is pretty vengeance based. At one at, at one point in the early comics, like Batman like carries a gun and shit, and so it, it is this sort of like vigilante vengeance whatever thing. That's how Batman starts. But what I what I think we run into in in the the culture of of Batman at DC Comics is that like. In you know in the 40s and 50s, and then they had the comics code. He's like he's and I, I hate this. But he's like running around in that blue and gray suit and underwear with some little kid <laughs> dressed in red and yellow. You know what I mean? And it's like they made they made you know they made him like, a super. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the Justice League would never work with Batman. They'd be like, "You're a piece of shit. Like you 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 beat people <laughs> up. Like <laughs> like you're get out of here. Like we can we can yeah. we can I can see who you are through your mask. I have X-ray vision, Bruce. Like Bruce fucking Wayne. get out of here. Yeah. And so yeah. I think I think that that now with stuff like Mask of the Phantasm, they showed you who Batman really is. He's a vigilante, and he's he's he is tortured as much by the the events that have happened to him as the way he chooses to deal with them and for us it's entertainment yeah. because we all want to be batman right we all want to put the costume on and, and zip around and do all the cool stuff right but for the character he's in agony and in this in this movie he's crying at his parents gravestone he's yeah. he's scared when he puts the mask on and 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 uh alfred sees batman for the first time Alfred has like a I'm gonna throw up like like kind of reaction, and that's another moment in the movie that's so brilliant because this guy's dressing as a bat. So before he was in the blue underwear, and you know, and there was bat mite and all these things, like you know, he's almost the punisher of of the DC universe, but people don't treat him like that. They wanna right. have him have him on the team and like whatever. And how well has that gone? Zack Snyder, yeah. you know what I, you know what I mean. Like I just, I, it hasn't gone well because you know you can't have this guy who can't fly and 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 chooses to use fear as a tool to work with all these happy, colorful superheroes and shit. So I think Batman at his best is is alone. I think I think I hate all the bat. I mean, I don't hate it, but like I'm not a fan of the Bat Family. I, I you know as a kid I loved Tim Drake as Robin, but. Yeah. get rid of that shit it should be him by himself so. and yeah and just like going after that vengeance but like you know as the decades take on we realize what what phantasm was trying to tell us 20 whatever year years ago and that is that this is this is somebody who is really good at what they do but it's violent and it's a it's a it's a self mechanism that is like supposed to bring him healing and it never does and it never will and now he's stuck doing it for the rest of his life because he's addicted to it that's this that's bad that, that's batman you know agreed um before we wrap things up here i wanted to uh talk about kevin conroy a little bit uh mm -hmm. i want to know because like like you said earlier like this is you know you're like if this is not in your top five you know batman films like it should be I want to ask you, like, as far as live action, animated, whatever, at, for you as a fan, when you think of Batman, where does Kevin Conroy fit in for you? Like, I mean, he is, I, I know for me, he is, when I think of at least the voice, the persona, like, he's mm -hmm. one of the first people that, if not the first person that pops up. So I want to uh, get your thoughts on, uh, on what yeah. he brought to that character. A, a lot and 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 the thing is is like not only is he the voice for the animated series and for the film that we talked about today but like also like in so many other you know i've seen i've seen aaron eckhart's version of a batman which is cool like in one in one of the yep. animated series whatever but there's just nobody who who has that sort of like i'm violent yet uh can play the bruce you know what i mean like he he just he just really nails it and when he leans into that i mean i saw him on a podcast a few years ago where they had him like read lines from like the dark knight or something and like the guy who who was hosting the podcast was like crying you know what i mean because like it is, <laughs> he, he he you know kevin conroy is 
is that that epic you know he is that um he is bruce wayne he is batman for more than just yeah. a generation and if you're a real batman fan like like you know i'm not you know i'm not trying to start a nerd war or whatever but i'm just saying like he he deserves his place in the pantheon with keaton with bale you know with um pattinson now and 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 with affleck he, he deserves his place in there um i think in the future we're there'll be more celebrate celebration for him just similar to how we you know i mean if I mean, adam west right you know yep. as, cor as corny as that stuff is like he's just now in the last five years because of his death and every, his contribution to Batman, he now has like, his place. He has, has his place. Yeah, he that. has his he yeah, has yeah. his place. And so, if you look yeah. at the bo body of work from Adam West versus the body of work from Kevin Conroy, it's vast. And yeah. if you ha if you haven't played the Batman Arkham games, Kevin Conroy is Batman in that, and you actually are Batman in that. And so, like, it is a very is a very beautiful experience to go and play batman voiced by kevin conroy over the force of, of the course of three games and you get to traverse right. gotham and what it, it's it's truly a gift and i think that he belongs right in there with all the names i mentioned and i think his contributions will be felt long long after uh you know the next then the next like 30 years i think people are really gonna and there'll be a lot of like found footage stuff and hope hope to god they do a big budget documentary you know i know they did well, one about great. him before but like we need we need that like 10 episode hbo uncut you know like yeah. docu -ser series on kevin conroy he deserves it he deserves his statue at warner brothers all the things right i'm glad he got to be bruce um one of the tv shows and uh on camera yeah um that's cool or whatever um but i think i think if you're a batman fan you, you know that like this man dude i mean he imagine like i just wonder like what he studied like what he what what comic books did he read what books on trauma did he pick up at the, well, the on, on amazon to, to that's learn interesting that. that you brought that up because like i guess when he walked in for it compared to when he had auditioned for the show they they said that he didn't have a vast knowledge of the comics. I think he this is something he learned after he started doing the character. And he was like an actor actor. He wasn't a voice actor. So I think that had a lot to do with probably how good he was because he wasn't just playing it as a voice actor. They said that when he would be in the booth, he would really be acting this out as if, you know, he was playing it almost in live action. Mm. And I guess they said what you find out later, I mean, for people that knew him, he was a gay man struggling with like coming out too. So he actually identified with a lot of the whole, I guess the loneliness, that part of being a Batman mm -hmm. and uh, dealing with all that. So he was able to tap into some of those things that probably worked wow. really well. I know. And I know another thing that also really helped. Uh, they said that a lot of the key players recorded together. So that informed a lot of the performances like Mark Hamill and him, frequently recorded together in the booth uh dan delaney said that she recorded with him uh doing andrea beaumont and all their stuff so mm -hmm. they were able to kind of bounce off each other and you kind of feel that when you even when you're watching this that you could tell that they're not separated when mm. uh and you know recording it and sending it in and they're just putting it together um so there's a lot of cool things i like i learned i mean i don't know everything about him but there was just things that i just learned just small for this that maybe appreciate him a, a bit more. I, I mean, I had no idea that yeah. one day he, I thought he had a career in voice acting. I mean, I, I would have guessed yeah. that, but like he, you know, he came into this as an actor and they said what they saw about him is that he looked the part. He looks like Hollywood, like good looking mm -hmm. guy. And they're like, well, I guess when he walked in, like one of the ladies was like, well, we're going to pick him. Right. And they're like, well, we got to hear him talk <laughs> first. Like basically, <laughs> And they said like no one. What they said no one was getting it right. No one was getting that kind of like dual persona. You know, mm -hmm. getting the Bruce Wayne part right, getting Batman right. They were yeah. trying hard, too hard to be Batman. Like kind of like dirtying up their voice and all that. And what came to him, it was just really natural. And I and he, what he did was what a lot of people believe the character is is yeah. that Batman is the real him, and Bruce Wayne is the secret identity, and that's how he approached the role.
Yeah, and, no, and, it's and, awesome. And, and that's why I think his Batman was so informed and not much, not, not so much like he was putting on a voice because he felt like that was the real person. And Bruce Wayne was the one that yeah. had to fake it. Yeah. So I thought that, that approach to that was like so cool to learn about. No, totally. And I and I just recalled that he is Bruce Batman's voice in the animated version of The Killing Joke, which did have a, the a theatrical release, which is way darker, right? So if you're a fan of Kevin Conroy, go go buy that one because that that's a good you know, people give give it shit because of the sex scene between um yep. <laughs> I, know, I know what you're talking about <laughs> Bruce, Bruce and uh or Batman and Batgirl, but like yeah, I, I think it's great. Whatever, um, yeah. you know, it's it, whatever. But like he he voices and Mark Hamill voices the Joker there too. So that's you know, play the Arkham games. Go definitely pick up. I mean, you can tell in Phantasm that Kevin Conroy is that again. That scene at the at the at the grave. Oh man, that should be yeah. one of the all time. And that's Kevin Conroy through and through. You know. And, they, yeah. and he probably had a lot of fun with that. Like, I hope that they release the extras. I actually own all the the whole series, um, and and as well as uh, uh, Phantasm. And then there was another movie they did uh, with subs, or it was called like Batman. Oh, that's Sub Zero. Zero, or Zero with uh, I, with uh, Mr. Freeze. Almost yeah, like I've never I, seen I, I it. All my, <laughs> Mr. Freeze, yeah, um, yeah, I. I think I hadn't seen that either. I, I kind of want to check it out, but then I might be disappointed that it's not. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I don't want. I, mean, I know, I know the cover art is really cheesy looking. I do remember that much about yeah. it. Um, yeah. but but I, I really do think Master of the Phantasm was probably his best moment as the character, and I think he kind of saw that he was getting like a full opportunity to uh to give that character as much as he could, like an arc from start to finish. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in a yeah. motion picture, what I thought was like. I mean, whether you know, given the fact that it's animated, it doesn't really matter. It it really, uh, it really does encompass some of the best moments of Batman and Bruce Wayne, and that is all Kevin Conroy. That's his voice, and yeah. he, and you know, it's something that he put his heart and soul into. And I know a lot of fan fans know how important he is to that character, and that he's he is attached to that character. You know that. Oh like, my god! Yeah. You know he might be gone, but like he, like he is very much like. Uh, he will always be associated with it and in, in the best way possible because uh he really gave that character uh its voice for a generation of kids that maybe weren't really familiar that maybe couldn't watch the movies yet you know they they did you know for whatever reason sure and, you know for you know for some people that could be their first exposure to batman for all oh, we know sure. so like yeah so that you know i think they all kind of have which is why it's always been hard for me to be like pick a favorite uh i mean i I think they all, maybe not George Clooney, but I think they all mostly have like a role, <laughs> <laughs> play, yeah. have their part, have their part in the grand pantheon of like Batman lore. Um, they all kind of like put their stamp on it. But yeah, I mean, uh, his is so good, and, and and it's a shame like they didn't, he didn't get a some sort of like voices like the computer of the fucking uh, <laughs> uh, the whatever vehicle or, or, or something like in in one of these bigger major right. <laughs> even like even like in the flash like what's your problem like i mean i have a lot of problems yeah. with, the, with the flash but like you can't <laughs> get kevin conroy in there but you can get christopher reeves you know and like they right. totally botched this michael keaton thing unfortunately in the flash like just throw kevin conroy in as, as a as a, a a version of you know the animated side i mean look look at what spider verse you know like that's that yeah. I mean, look no further, right? And I think there will be homages to him, and and um, I know they said there's one more appearance in the tank after this Suicide Squad oh, that, game. He, that, that he completed or before he died, yeah, but whatever. But I also know, like, someone was talking somewhere where there's hours and hours of footage of what you said of like the voice actors like talking, like doing their roles or whatever. Like, I'm sure, yeah. you know, I hope that I hope we get HBO Max. Or a Max, whatever they call it today, um, documentary series about the animated series, but mainly about Kevin Conroy because well, people don't really know. I mean, that's I didn't know that about him being lonely and being in the closet. Like that's fascinating. I mean, that informs yeah. you could hear that in his voice now. You know? Yeah. Apparently, he uh, at one point wrote a comic book story about an actor 
who is struggling with that. And they said, like, if you can, uh, they said it's really well written. And, you know, that's kind of like, and that's what they think he was able to tap into whatever he needed to to tap into for playing Batman. I bet they said that he really did treat it more than just a voiceover role. And they, mm-hmm. he also loved the fans. Like, he really, really loved the fans. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they loved him, clearly. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, like, uh, he definitely is a huge part of pop culture in a really big way. And, mm-hmm. yeah. And I, uh, like you said, that moment at the cemetery, I, that was the one thing I, I mean, the movie's great, but that, that stood out to me as like, I was like, oh, I could see dude in the booth just doing some real acting and not just like speaking into like, you know, yeah, like mic- microphone or whatever. Like he was probably like, got really into that. Um, and you could tell in the delivery. So yeah, really, really, uh, terrific actor that got like a, you know, some I think some people would view this part as like, oh, you don't get to see his face, you only hear his voice, but like he his voice transcends that and mm-hmm. doesn't really matter. Um, I think for a lot of people, they would even rank him higher than many of the live action Batman. So I think that's uh a test yeah. to how good he is. I've seen that. I've also seen Mark Hamill say that he's not doing the Joker again. Um because uh, Kevin Kevin Conroy is gone. So I mean I guess uh, we'll we'll see, but you yeah. Know. Sure, Mark Hamill doesn't need the money. No, no, you know? he's, I think he's fine. He's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's doing okay. Um, uh, before we uh, wrap these things up, we always like to give the movies a score at the end. Um, however, you want to score it, whether it's your letterbox up to five stars, uh, out of one to ten, letter grade, whatever you want to give it. Uh, what do you give Batman Mass of the Phantasm? And if you have any final thoughts, you share with me um yeah so I, i'm gonna give this a five i think it's it, it's not only a great film right but it, it it's for everyone but it's an adult film you know and it tackles issues that i think you know we talk about mental health and and, and whatever and, and and violence i mean all these things turn on any channel right you go to go to social media like whatever this film like deals with those things in such a head-on not shy away from the pain of loss the pain of of um mental unwellness and and the pain of the pain of there being no good choices because you know a choice you lose out on something else right and and i think it just just it not only does it do a fantastic job of all that, the acting is amazing. There is something about this movie that I can't put my finger on. It's the way it sounds, the way it looks, the way it smells. I know that doesn't make sense, but but <laughs> no, I, I, get I think <laughs> I, I feel like if you could see it at a midnight screening on a on a Friday or Saturday night, Thursday night, whatever, in your city, if just whatever. I know a lot of people don't have that in an old theater. It will blow your mind. It will blow your mind like Batman 89 did. You will realize like this is this is spooky. This is scary. This feels kind of personal. And it's also just like a fun ride. It is bleak. It is dark. But you get Kevin Conroy. You know, you get Mark Hamill as the Joker. You know, I'm again, you know, we need Andrea Beaumont. Uh, and, and, and the phantasm to come into the real world now. And I, I yep. would just encourage, encourage everybody to just, just to go buy it on, you know, however you buy it. If you buy physical media, great, digital, great, whatever. But see, see this thing, appreciate this thing for what it was. Watch it really late at night. I think you'll, you'll yep. really, you really dig it. So yeah, I'm going to give it a five. I'm going to give it a five as well. Um, I Like I said, I hadn't watched it in years. I forgot how good it was. And mm-hmm. it holds up really well. I It is probably one of the best Batman projects uh, out there. Um, mm-hmm. I love that it deals with like multiple themes. It is adult, and it, it but it is able to tell a line where it's adult, but you know, kids can appreciate it for what it is too. Um, I, you know, I think it's interesting that when they, like when they were promoting it, they were, pro- they were promoting exclusively on that kid on the kids never right they're probably only really promoting it during batman animated series for children and in reality if they would have played this more to it at the time it might have done a little better uh at the box office too i think and um i don't know it's it's it feels so much more than an animated film it feels much more cinematic than mm-hmm. it being an animated film um 
Uh, it's really well written. And like we said, the voice acting is top notch as well. Um, I also agree. Justice for Adrian Beaumont. Phantasm. I would love to see more of. Uh, Dude, yeah. I would love to see that in live action form. And yeah, if you get your hands on it, yeah, get the 4K. But if you are creative with like tinkering with uh, cover art, try to <laughs> try to get try to get the original cover art on your uh-huh. uh, 4K. Yeah. Uh, not saying this isn't fine it's i get it <laughs> i think so this so, so so this so this looks like this is being sold to like a child to children yeah. like this looks more like uh, you know like hey my, my kid should pick this up um yeah i don't I know who's don't know in that, charge that, over there yeah that original cover art is iconic so yeah if you get that try to try to you know make shift your own little cover art with the original uh yeah, art for it, or even, like just go look up the original poster. I mean, that thing is yeah, that thing. It is, looks great. Oh man, it, it, yeah, incredible. It, it's so. Um, I mean, and and honestly, the Batman films, Batman comic books have all been really good at having these key pieces of art that just stand out. I mean, we talked about it with eighty nine. I even think Batman Returns had it too. They had the one Batman logo that had like all the snow around it. Mm-hmm. And that was like their first little teaser poster. Mm-hmm. And then honestly, the three image poster with Batman, uh, Cat One, and Penguin that's all like kind of dark is really cool. Yeah, it was just until just until people saw it that they were like, "Ooh, uh, <laughs> what was that?" <laughs> yeah, I like the Batman cool. Returns poster because it, you're right; it's the snowy Bat logo, Batman logo, and underneath it, right. I think it just says Returns. Yeah, on yeah, the original. And it's great. It's like a good teaser poster. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I know such a great movie, and I'm glad you picked it. Another solid choice on your thank part. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, not not Vanilla Sky, guys. One day, one day, <laughs> we will, we will, we will get to it. But I think we should do something like out of the or like extraordinary for it, like something weird. We should do like some weird kind of promo or something where no, where, that would be fun. Yeah, like I'll shoot a, a, some sort of reel. You you'll shoot some sort of reel and then we'll sort of I don't know like that's like using the music or something or or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah, we should talk about it because now that uh, now this is going to be on in the YouTube space, we can probably utilize that a lot more. So we oh, should yeah. talk about how we prom- how we promote that. Totally, I will probably talk your ear off about Bill on the Sky. All Dude, <laughs> uh, same same here. I saw that thing when it came out. I saw that thing four times in the theater. So that's what you're dealing with. So good. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. Well, guys, until next time, this is Gaius. And thank you again, Dustin, for joining me on Back to the Box Office Presents Deep Dives. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods. But we like to shout out the uh, Playlist Studio app because they are a podcast network. And you can get their app in the iOS store or in the Google Play store if you have one of those pesky droid Samsung phones <laughs> with the with the green bubble text. Oh, um, no, no, and, no. <laughs> and, then, and then you will also be able to see this episode up on YouTube. We're going to be gradually building up that channel uh, throughout the year as another way for you guys to discover us. Uh, as always, thanks for listening. Again, Dustin, thank you for joining me. Always a pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. Can't wait to have you back. And until next time, guys, peace. <laughs>